welcome back, everybody. Um, breakout sessions. Wow. Um, that's all I've got to say. I, I, I went to two. I can't yet time travel, but the two I were in absolutely blew me away. So thank you to everybody physically and online who contributed. Um, I'm even more excited now than I was at the start of the day. I'm less nervous than I was at the start of the day, to be fair. Uh, and the reason I'm less nervous is I don't have the really difficult job, which is turning those brilliantly rich conversations into some actions that we can all discuss and take forward. That is down to the job of the brilliant facilitators. So what we're going to do in this next session is I'm not going to ask them to give a blow-by-blow -blow account of each of the breakout sessions. We will produce a short report detailing the key outcomes that we will circulate to all participants after the event. But what I've asked them to do is just to capture for the two breakout sessions that they were uh, facilitating what, what the excitement in the room was, what were two or three of the key messages that came through. So just to give us a flavour. So uh, first of all, uh, can I, Jim, can I invite you up to the mic, please? Um, thank you, Nick. Um, so uh, the uh, first session that um, I had the uh, uh, pleasure of facilitating was one on reward and recognition for an open culture. Um, I've, got, I've got four headlines here. Sorry, Nick, not three, but four. Um, uh, the first one was around... Uh, including open culture in job descriptions, personal specifications, promotion criteria, um, making sure that appointing panels uh, uh, consists of a wide range of people. In that way, the stories get out there in terms of what actually happens at that appointment process. So that was the first one. The, the second thing is if you're going to do that, you need to clearly identify what is recognised, what you're going to give credit for. Um, that's going to require detail. Um, there was an encouragement for us to develop that with the community, what the community values, I think, is really important. Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, and identify what's valued. And it's what's valued in terms of, of, of outputs, in terms of excellence, and indeed we were challenged whether actually excellence was the right word there or not. Um, the third thing is that, that we... It, uh, when it comes to reward and recognition, it's about, it's not necessarily about recognising and rewarding individuals, but recognising and rewarding in a coherent way teams, mentors, leaders, institutions, student education, and research. Um, and then to underpin all of that, uh, we were encouraged to look at having in place multi level governance, which is important in terms of uh, enabling transparency and creating trust. So that was what came out of the first one. Is this what you're after, Nick? That's absolutely perfect. Um, uh, and then the, the, the second session that I had the pleasure of uh, facilitating was one on open infrastructure for an open access to higher education. Um, one of the challenges that we were presented was not everybody has access to the internet and that we need to be really, really, really mindful of that when we're trying to make sure things are open. And the, the, the concept that was, was, came out quite clearly when we're, when we're making things open is about creating spaces that are welcoming, that enable people to share work. Uh, and, and I've noted here that that's both physical and digital. Um, and, and creating spaces in the very broadest sense is, is, is working with organisations that, that can go out to communities that don't necessarily have um, the internet access and actually work with communities in their location rather than getting the, 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 the people that in those communities to come to where there is the internet access. Um, we were encouraged to fund teams, not projects. And it was about funding teams that were, who could be agile, who could integrate systems. Huge numbers of systems exist that those need integrating. And that needs to be, those teams need to do it in a sustainable and maintained way. It's a long-term commitment. And the notion there is that if you fund the team, then they can be agile, they can integrate the systems, they, they will sustain and maintain it and, and be bought into it. And uh, don't suffer the project coming to an end. 
Um, we were encouraged to uh, build websites and experiment with websites and, and the notion of, of, of enabling people to create websites that, that involve low code. I, th I think the notion there was make it simple for people to get websites. If you make the information there on the internet, people will be able to find it. If people don't know about it, then it's not of much use. So it's about finding data. Have I got that right, Masood? Find the data? Yeah. Uh, we, uh, we felt that it was also important that um, if we were going to make data open source, open access, that we needed to share datable in a responsible way. There are, are, are some instances where sharing data may not be in the best interest of the people who, whose data has been shared. Um, and we, we came to a strap line for this lot, which was creation, curation, commitment. There we go. Thank you, Jim. That was exactly what I wanted. Um, and I now leave a challenge to my next two facilitators. They have to have a strap line too. Uh, my next, my next uh, facilitator who is now really worried and has got, uh, is Emma. Please, Emma, come up and tell us about the sessions you, were, you led. Thank you. So I had the pleasure of being in both the session on open research and open education. And I just want to start out by saying thank you so much to the people in those groups because the amount of discussion and ideas, sorry, I've got five from one of mine, uh, has been absolutely fantastic. And a huge thank you to Ruth who managed to cohere it into something that I could write down. So in the first one on open research, uh, we started out with a fantastic idea around pooling resources within Ken to create an open data archive to reduce the barriers to data access. So many of the repositories are behind a paywall or they're linked to funders. And actually having a Ken data archive that would be open to all, <coughs> three at the point of use, would be truly open access and enable people to access and reuse the data. Alongside that one, um, there was a, a nice um, idea to encourage metadata and narratives around data generation. So this will not only help people to find and reuse the data, but it helps to translate across audiences. So breaking down barriers put in place by languages or disciplines. Then we moved on to some storytelling. So how do we create stories that go across all disciplines, but alongside that, bring in citizen experience. So identifying diverse forms of knowledge and finding out where these norms are and where they've been challenged and disrupted in order to dig into these and learn from them. Number four on my list, um, and I, I, I personally found this one um, exciting. How do we create a plan within institutions to demystify what we do? So how do we truly let the communities that we are part of know who we are and what we're doing so it's more understandable? And in turn, we will then better understand the community that we strive to be a part of. And right at the very end, in the last minute, so I'm afraid we didn't have much time to go into discussion, there was an idea about partnership with publishers. And I think this is one that um, colleagues in the library might want to take a bit further. But how could publishers become part of Ken to sign up to the declaration um, and be a, a, a core component of that? In my second one, we talked about open education. So there was um, a nice crossover in the first idea. We've got fair data. So we use, um, we use the term fair data. And that is currently being defined, not quite there yet. But how can we also have fair education? So what can we do as a group to define what fair would look like in education? Then there was one, uh, a nice idea about the collaborative global network. So we're already making steps to create these networks. So how could we get a collaborative global network to share educational resources? to learn from them, to adapt them for our own individual purposes, but most importantly, to encourage reuse. So if we want to learn from what we've already got, we can get a bank of resources, um, a bank of examples, and encourage the reuse of those. So it's not just about continually generating new knowledge, it's about reusing what we've already got. And alongside that, there was a nice idea to make educational resources easier to find. So educational resources should have um, a digital object identifier. I'm hoping I've got that right, Jim. 
And finally, um, the, the take home message, I suppose, from, from my breakouts, get students involved in Ken. Get them involved in the discussions. It's about lifelong learning. Thank you, Emma. And you may have had five, but I can already see some commonalities appearing. So I can see, I can see the reducing and coming down to the core. Our final uh, facilitator is Samantha. Well, we're doing a dog lap. <laughs> you go first. OK. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we were facilitating the session on... Uh, tackling global challenges through open partnerships within HE. And we had a lively and interesting discussion and we were challenged by our provocateurs to uh, really think through, in the first place, how um, the innovation space within HE, how um, innovation might be catalyzed across disciplines and across sectors. Um, and the, I guess, something that came up both in this session and the session uh, following, um, which we've heard about a lot today, was the challenge about who's in the room and whose voices are being heard and can we get the right people and how do we make that happen? So that was a recurring theme and I think um, Samantha will touch on that as well. Um, we talked about how Ken might be an opportunity to create space for activism um, uh, around knowledge equity. We, uh, I, think Jeff, I think it was Jeff who suggested that actually this is a moment where we can be anticipatory. I think that was the word you used, to be proactive, to think about who we can influence in terms of funders, for example, in terms of um, influencing new models of learning and teaching and assessment. Um, and also uh, feeding into policy and governments. Um, so the, the, the talk was wide ranging and I don't think I've captured all of it, but um, hopefully Nick, we're gonna be able to record it and, and uh, send it out to everybody. Thanks, Abby. So um, the second session we did was reducing inequalities through opening access to higher education. It's really hard to capture the spirit of the two speakers. Um, on my piece of paper, I've got, uh, I've drawn a, a pond with some water, a ship and an elephant. If you were there, you know. Um, they, they, they were genuinely uh, inspiring. Uh, it was fantastic. Our challenge is, um, so Gino threw, th um, threw down some questions for us. Um, how do we lead by example? What role do students have playing into a lot of the conversations that have been going on? What is open education? And um, if you help, do they owe you something? Which is a really powerful question. Um, so in terms of the open education, we had a lot of conversations about how do you reach out? We talked about the ivory towers. We heard about a great thing that's happening at Pretoria. We also talked about what's happening at Leeds. Um, who are the people that we want to work with? How, how, how do we work with them? And where is knowledge generated? And that's really important to try and capture and look at things that already exist that we can work with and learn from. Um, that was a conversation I think we had in the first room is who are we learning from? Um, as educators or as, a, as an institution educates. Um, and then Karen um, challenged us to think about how will the network work? Um, and we talked to, and she talked about the ethics of care for the network, ethical partnering, it's not transactional, what's in it for, for everybody, and what is a just collaboration and, a, and what is just partnering? Is that, is that right, Karen? Thank you. And this could be a focus for the network is how this network does what it does. Where are the, where are the voices that aren't yet heard or aren't in the room? I know these, it's very easy to say these big statements, but, but I think there were some real um, ideas and challenges that, that I think applying to the actual network itself and the way it works 
would would make it um, a model for the future. Karen gave us some examples of where um, good practice happens in networks, like there are some things in the UK, but where that really challenging place where it's all brought together and held in, in um, not in a governance structure necessarily, but how is it held so that everybody is part of the, the vessel, going back to my drawing of a boat. And now, if Gino's here, I'll let him tell you about the elephant maybe over the reception drinks. <laughs> but uh, honestly, thank you so much. It was, it was a great conversation. It, it went off in all sorts of really exciting ways, which I don't think we anticipated, but that's what this network's about, I think. So thank you. Thank you, Abby and Samantha. Um, before I pass over to Simone to give uh, some closing words for the first Ken Summit, I'd just like to take a couple of minutes to thank some people. So, first of all, can I thank everybody who's participated, whether you are virtually here or physically here. Um, you have helped make this a success, and I think... Um, you've just doubled down on my determination to continue to drive this forward and to make it a success. Can I particularly thank our speakers and panelists from this morning and for our breakout sessions, our provocateurs. For the sessions I went to, you did exactly what I asked you for. You poked, you prodded, you weren't nice, you made us think, and that's exactly what I wanted. Uh, I'd like to pick out a few individuals. I'd like to thank uh, Fiona and Tom, uh, my team. I think it's fair to say none of us would be here if they hadn't told us where to be. Um, so the fact that they have helped bring this all together is fantastic. Um, I'd also like to thank the Meet in Leeds team and Alan Gallagher for organising the food, making sure we knew where to go, hosting us in Nexus. Um, it's made this an event that hopefully we will remember and want to come back and do again. Um, can I also thank Motus? Uh, you have made sure that we are connected with everybody wherever they are in the globe. The videography that you're doing that we will use in future events, the, the seamless way we've been able to communicate in the room and out the room has been fantastic. Can I finally thank is Jed Hall. So Jed was our, uh, was our MC for this morning. He wasn't our MC until about 48 hours ago when, when due to illness, our previous MC had to, to, to duck out. Um, I think you'll all agree, at very short notice, he did an absolute fantastic job. <laughs> finally, um, our facilitators, our engagement leads, the people who helped bring together this really rich conversation and will help to take it forward to the next steps. Um, thank you for agreeing to help on the day and thank you for agreeing to help for the months to come. Um, it's, going to make, it's going to make this a really exciting journey and it is the start of a journey. So can I ask you just to put your hands together one last time for everybody who has supported and made this happen.